Hello. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this IWA webinar on accelerating sludge management towards sustainability. My name is Richard Sang. Uh, I am a uh, sludge treatment and uh, management specialist with CDM Smith in the United States. I'm also the current chair of the IWA Sludge uh, Management Specialist Group. Uh, welcome to, to our webinar today. Uh, we have a good program for you. Uh, before I get into the agenda, uh, just a little advertisement for our group. Uh, our our Sludge Management Specialist Group uh, deals with all kinds of issues uh, related to sludge. Uh, not only wastewater sludge, but other sludge as well. So if you're interested, please join us. And uh, you can easily uh, find us on the IWA Connect uh, website. Uh, just so you know, these webinar will be recorded and uh, the slides and presentation will be made available afterwards on the IWA website. Uh, during the uh, presentations, uh, your audio will be uh, muted. Uh, so there are two ways that you can communicate with us uh, through the chat box. Uh, please use this for general requests. You have uh, comments and other things, you can use that. But for questions uh, to, the, to our presenters, please use the QA box. Uh, and if your question is addressed specifically to a speaker, please put the name in so we know who to direct it to. So now uh, let me introduce uh, today's speakers. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Pooja Doshi. Uh, Pooja holds a master's degree uh, in law and economy and anthropology. Uh, she is a certified project manager, uh, consulting and developing projects, speaker and trainer uh, with Engineer Without Borders in Germany. Uh, then we also have Professor Ludovico uh, Spinoza. Uh, for over 41 years, uh, he was the senior scientist in sludge management research uh, with the Italian National Research Council. He's currently serving as expert member on sludge standardization and coordination of soil and waste at UNI, which is the Italian standardization body. Uh, Dr. Spinoza has been chair of the sludge management group for a couple of terms, also received a, a research medal. Uh, he's also an IWA fellow. Uh, here is the agenda today. Uh, we just done the welcome introduction. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Dr. Spinoza speak first, followed by Pooja. And there will be some conclusion remark, uh, followed by discussion and QA session. Uh, so with that, let's uh, move into the presentation by Professor Spinoza. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your kind words. My presentation, it will be dealing about the technical aspects, while the, the, the presentation that will follow by Pooja Doshi will deal with uh, institutional and the technical aspects, institution aspects. Next slide, please. Uh, I start uh, by remembering that the target 6.3 of the sustainable development goals of the, of the UN agenda 2030, uh, which focus uh, on reducing pollution and increasing uh, reduction by recycling and pushing towards the achievement of sustainability. So it is necessary now to uh, push ever more decisively towards the achievement of sustainability objectives in the governance of wastewater and sludge management systems. 
I like to remember also that uh, uh, it must not also not be forgotten that an effective and real achievement of sustainability objectives cannot disregard respect for a circular economy and thermodynamic principles. The definition, I start with a short definition of the three uh, aspects, the three uh, principles that I mentioned before. For, the sust for sustainability, there are many definitions, but where that this feels to me better is that a sustainable, a sustainable situation occur when consumption of re renewable resource does not exceed natural ability for their replenishment. This means that sustainability must be seen according to three uh, points. It must be environmental bearable, economically conven convenient, and socially acceptable, acceptable. And you can see on the figure that there is an interchange between uh, these three points. What is important to say that sustainability depends on the, ter on the ter territorial context in which it applies. So uh, it must be seen from a relative, not absolute point of view. What is sustainable, for example, in an agricultural area may not be sustainable in an industrial land. And this is very important. About the uh, circular uh, economy, it's necessary to, um, uh, the definition is that uh, it defines, uh, circular economy defines an economic system designed to regenerate itself. It is uh, most often represented by a circle, only a circle, and this is wrong. Because for any process, we can, can uh, we, we will leave in all cases, uh, some losses to be replaced by new resources. So, the correct representation is what is in. But this is valid for one process. The wastewater treatment system, so wastewater treatment and sludge management, consists of a sequence of a number of single processes and or, and or sub processes, which uh, uh, the, the challenge is to reduce, reduce the total amount of, of losses for all the processes included into the system and subsequently the need of new resources, which must re-establish the mass energy balance. Normally, uh, I just like to remember that the circle is uh, without the beginning and without an end, is a figure that has, has always represented the harmony and the intellectual dimension. That is the spiritual world. While the square, that is the polygon made of four slides, represent rational thought, logic, and the physical world. So in the attempts of uh, humanity to, uh, to, got, to reach a circle, starting from a square polygon, a four-side polygon, we, uh, we can say that we can improve the number, the number of sides of a polygon. So with the, the higher, the greater the number, the, 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 the greater the number of sides of the polygon, the greater the approximation of the system to a circle, a circle can be seen in the, in the figures in the bottom. And just I remember, I like to remember that in, the, in our region, in the southeast of Italy, near my house, there is a, a castle of built in uh, um, uh, 12th century, which uh, is the, 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 the tentative to reach the, 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 the circle, uh, which represent the circle. And this consists of eight sides, and each of sides is connected to the previous Process, uh, wall uh, at the, the following uh, uh, side with eight rectangular um, uh, towers, each consisting of eight sides. So we have in, in substance, uh, this is a, a architectural representation of a systems in, uh, in, in a circular economy concept. However, the problem of circular economy is that the social dimension of sustainability is only marginally addressed as it is mainly uh, addressed to economy and the environment. Uh, the thermodynamics law are often 
forgotten. But all, we have to record, to we have to remember that all human operated transformations are not perfect or fully fully reversible. So they are subject to the three laws of thermodynamics. The one is the energy is invariably conserved, but assume different forms, some of which cannot be conveniently recovery. So energy matter losses are always occurring. The entropy is the second principle. Entropy is a measure of the disorder in an isolated system. And the second principle of thermodynamics say that the entropy constantly increase, thus meaning that the worse state than before is always involved and more disorder. The third principle is the absolute zero value is impossible to be reached by fin finite processes so that perpetual motion, yeah, infinite, infinite recycling is impossible. These are three principles that must be uh, keep in mind. Just a few words about uh, the situation, the, what sludge is. Sludge is the unavoidable byproduct of a water wastewater treatment system. Just for your information, the, in Europe, the average generation rate is of, of about 59 grams per capita per day, with a big range from 20 degrees and 108 in Portugal. And these differences can be explained in terms of population served, type of wastewater treatment, and water availability. The problem is that although sludge accounts for only about 1-2% in volume of the treated wastewater, it contains most of the pollution and is both difficult and expensive to be handled, often, often required over 50% of the operating budget for the wastewater treatment plant. However, in the conventional, uh, during the planning, in the conventional planning or designing of sludge treatment and disposal, often, often sludge is considered of secondary importance with respect to the wastewater treatment system. And this can be explained because it is placed at its physical location, is at the end of the water uh, of the water cycles. So it is uh, underestimated, but we will see that is more important. You can see in the figures, uh, we can go from the wastewater treatment plant to the sludge production and to a possible reuse of sludge, but the reuse of sludge is directly connected, it directly influences the wastewater treatment. To comply with the SD, the Sustainable Development Goals of the UN agenda, we need it emerge that we look, have to look at the sludge management from a different perspective, aiming at accelerating the development of more sustainable strategies oriented to maximize recovery benefits instead of simply disposing. Way to accelerate sludge management sustainability, we can consider two points. Consider sludge management as the locomotive and not the last wagon of the wastewater systems, and I will explain in the following, and taking into account both technical and institutional aspects, the technical actions, are in, in, aimed at improving sustainability by maximizing the recovery benefits, while for the institutional access, uh, the, the Pujadoshi will, will speak in the following uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Okay. So as I measure, measured before, uh, sludge, the treatment and disposal of sludge is uh, um, not, not generally in the conventional um, way, uh, plays a secondary role during the design planning phase of wastewater, as it is considered the terminal due to its, uh, to its physical location. But forgetting that the most appropriate uh, treatment for the sequence of treatment to adopt for the for wastewaters is strongly, strongly driven by the sludge reuse disposal options available in the specific local context. It is in no sense to 
produce sludge for agricultural use uh, if there is enough, enough land in that area or vice versa in the industrial area is not, is not, is not necessary to produce sludge for, in, for uh, agricultural use. Consequently, sludge management should be conceptually, this is a question of concept, considered as the locomotive of the water cycle train. We have to start from the end finding which are the particular option for, for reuse available in a specific context and go, come back, go back to the wastewater treatment to adopt the treatment to obtain, to get the results, the characteristics of the sludge we are needed for a specific type of recovery. In a sustainable sludge management network, we have to consider that uh, I represented this as, as a, a with an aeronautic no, illustration. There are not, it's not possible to, to, uh, to, fl to fly directly from uh, the origin to the destination. We have to introduce some treatments in, 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 in within, within the, 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 these terminal points, initial and terminal points. So uh, we need, uh, in this context, there are two, uh, two points, two uh, treatments that constitute, that are really a hub, as they are always, uh, they can, can be found in all, in all, in all uh, treatment um, sludge management systems. And these problems are the reduction of nuisances through stabilization and digestion, and the reduction of volume through thickening and devotering. So this means that um, uh, we have always to pass through these two hubs to improve the uh, um, sustainability and sustainable management. It is also important to, to remind that the any stabilization digestion methods also reduce the sludge amount by degrading, degrading volatile solids. Uh, for the reduction of nuisances, Yes, stabilization, that is stabilization or digestion. Uh, the new developments, uh, the, 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 the way consists in the first, the limitation at the source of harmful, harmful substances entering the wastewater treatment plant. This is very important. Develop strategies and technologies to improve sludge quality and reduce, uh, in order to reduce nuisances, health risks and handling costs. Uh, in these slides are, are shown some improvements for anaerobic digestion or for aerobic digestion and the new uh, research areas include uh, the presence and fate of, of estrogenic compounds, enzyme treatments, molecular mates, may, may methods on microbial population. As regards the reduction of volume, uh, we are two possibilities. This reduction can occur, take place in the water treatment line. There are several processes by cellular leases, increased age of sludge utilization, membrane technology, thermal electrolysis process, etc. Or reducing the sludge volume in, within the sludge treatment line. And uh, this, uh, the, the advance, the the advancement in this, play, in this uh, field consists in more effective, effective chemicals to make easier uh, the solid liquid separation, the use of body biopolymers to decrease the environmental impact, and the new technologies based on the combination of mechanical and other forces, electrical field, thermal supply, ultrasound, etc. But what it is important to say is that the goal is not pushing sludge production toward an absolute minimum, but making sludge amount volume compatible with its final destination and the best overall energy material balance. Uh, so it is not necessary to, to obtain the, the lower volume, but we need the volume that is sufficient, uh, that is necessary for the specific uh, uses or reuse that has been planned. Another important point is that the digitalization can affect both technical and institutional aspects of, of wastewater sludge management 
On the side of uh, technical aspects, digitalization could be of great help as it allows a greater operational capacity and control to be obtained through real time monitoring. So we are possible uh, to, um, um, this system digitalization can be described as the convergence from an operational technology or the physical set with the informational technology, which is a, a digital twin that online can change the variable, the operating variables of the, the plant, the physical plant to change, to um, improve its uh, performance. Uh, which are the, uh, some example of processes that can be coupled to a digital twin with a wastewater sludge within a wastewater sludge treatment plant. In stabilization digestion, we can monitor the biogas composition to control digester process instabilities. Continuous, the another, pro, another possibility is the continuous monitoring of odors with consequent modification of operating parameters. Another is an example is the installation of a foam sensor to activate surface discharge or removal op op options, trap on gas line and protection to the pressure release valve. And this is uh, are some example that uh, can be based on the availability of uh, appropriate sensor to measure, to control, to monitor these uh, characteristics. In the thickened dewatering, we have many, um, many more possibilities, options. For example, in a gravity thickener, we can adapt polymer dosage to settling velocity. In the centrifuge, through the digitalization, it is possible to adapt the polymer dosage and the mechanical uh, operator operating variables of the machine, like differential speed and conveyor torque, to cake centrate suspended solid content and flow rate of the incoming sludge. So we can maintain the performance at a good level. For filter pressing, it's possible to regulate the volume and mass rates, the pressure rise and mixing ener energy to optimize the filtration results and minimize requirement of conditioning agent. Polymer consumption is, a, we, we already seen in the previous three examples, but polymer consumption is very important because we can monitor the polymer dosing through some zeta potential, streaming current director measurement or the direct measurement by spectrometry, spectrometry, spectrometry photometry or rheology using an inert trace electrostatically bound to the flocculant. And this, this allows the polymer consum consumption to help to be uh, optimized and consequently the uh, cost reduced. Just I summarize in, a in, in this uh, slide the conclusion. We say there is a main conclusion is that we have to accelerate the sludge management towards sustainability. It is necessary to approach the wastewater sludge management systems with respect for criteria of greater responsibility in social, environmental, and economic terms, which are the sustainability principles, without uh, we considering also the circular economy and the thermodynamic principle. From, the, uh, from this point, sludge management should be considered, conceptually considered, as the locomotive of the water cycle train, because the most appropriate sequence to adopt for wastewater treatment is strongly driven, driven by the sludge reuse disposal options available in the specific local contacts. We need first to, to check which are the options to reuse or to dispose of the sludge. And then we must go back, as I told before, to the treatments in the wastewater sludge, in the wastewater system, systems. Second, we have also to introduce some technical actions aimed at improving sustainability by maximizing recovery benefits instead of just disposal. And this must be, uh, must be introduced, this adopted, these uh, technical uh, actions. 
I think this is my last slide. I think I hope to have been in my times and thank you very much for your for uh, for your attendance. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Spinoza. That's a very interesting and uh, stimulating presentation. Uh, we will have uh, further discussion on your presentation towards the end. Uh, so I see some questions already coming in. Uh, please uh, uh, type your question in the Q&A uh, using the Q&A box over there. Uh, so now uh, we will move into the second uh, presentation by Mr. Puja Doshi. Puja? Yes, sure. hello. Also, welcome from my side. I would like to proceed with the second part of our presentation, which are the institutional aspects that help us to accelerate sludge management towards sustainability. Next slide, please. To establish innovative technology that leads wastewater and sludge management towards sustainability, it is pivotal to enable the right institutional environment and remove. Basically, we have identified three barriers, endogenous factors, exogenous factors, and something that is called legal pluralism. Endogenous barriers are mostly related to socio-cultural or imminent factors that uh, prevent, for example, uh, to, that, that prevent people, for example, to recycle waste. They're mostly tied to local economic, political, or cultural priorities. And uh, therefore, <clears throat> one must see wastewater management in a highly contextualized context, in a, in a highly, one should address wastewater management in a highly contextualized approach. Please excuse me. Solutions regarding the system must be tailored according to the local needs, and one needs to distinguish between rural, peri-urban, or urban areas, formal and informal settlements, such as slums, and consider site-specific circumstances, such as climate, soil quality, level of groundwater table, cultural aspects, space, etc. Exogenous factors are mainly related to the economic access to public systems and include water poverty, socially disadvantaged groups, or low-income households. An example, um, you know, first I'll get to the third one, legal pluralism. So legal, uh, legal pluralism, Pluralism describes basically uh, legal practices and norms that are not to be seen as monolithic entities, but uh, which are in fact multi-layered and subject to negotiation and enforcement. And one can see a gap between rules and behavior, just as a summary of what legal pluralism entails. A possible solution or remedy for the exogenous factors could be to establish pricing mechanisms. Pricing mechanisms uh, can support us in a threefold manner. They can act as a fine tuning instruments for social aspects. They can be a revenue raise, they can be used as a revenue raising instrument covering operational and maintenance costs. And with the polluter pays principle, you can ensure long time investment. As a, as, as a fine tuning instrument, um, there is the example of the so-called block tariff system, which was promoted by the World Bank in the 1970s. It is a price structure in which a commodity, water, is priced at a very low initial rate, up to a speci specified volume of use, which is a block, then at a higher or several increasing higher rates for additional blocks being used. The price of water in the initial block is set very low, usually at a rate to ensure that poor people are not discouraged from using the amount of water considered essential for human needs, typically 25 to 50 liters per capita per day. This results in higher marginal prices to the customer and thus higher average prices for higher income households, but helps in discouraging extravagant extra wagoned water use and promotes water con conservation. 
However, the system could result in adverse effects because the assumption that every household owns a water meter does not reflect the reality in many developing countries where many households in higher densely populated area, such as slums, share one water meter, perhaps. This means that the marginal and average costs per water meter are automatically placed into a higher tariff system. Further, many households do not have access to any sort of water meter, so they're dependent on water vendors and this system results in adverse unintended effects. In spite of the adverse effects, nonetheless, um, the system of the block tariff, the system of the block tariff supports low level incomes, uh, low level income or low level income households to gain access to the wastewater system. The third barrier is legal pluralism. Legal plural, plural, pluralism is characterized by the coexistence of rules from different origin and legitimization, for example, as the result of history through colonialism. This coexistence often leads to an overlap of customary laws, religious laws, national laws, or even international principle, principles derived from global water policy concepts. The concept of legal pluralism also includes the distinction between categorical or official, the euro, rights, and concrete or effective de facto rights. The formal acceptance of law does not mean that law is really applied into practice. Obeying the law without complying with it can be seen as a reminiscence of colonial times. The categorical right is embodied in the legal status, where, whereas the concrete right is embodied into social relationship between actual people. And this concept helps us to understand why implementation and enforcement of existing regulation often seem to fail. Legal pluralism, which refers basically to the lack of law enforcement and the existence of multiple layers in legal, in legal or semi-legal systems within people usually negotiate, where, within, within which people usually negotiate and make decisions. The stickiness describes when formal institutions outlive their usefulness, but are resilient to change or dissolution. Institutional dynamics can be addressed by choosing the right institutional path. There are different paths um, that one can, one can choose from. And the first one would be the path, path dependency, which um, again describes a certain stickiness to institutions. So here, historical or cultural traditions and policy legacies influence actual actions and tend not to adapt towards new circumstances. An institutional bricolage means that new elements are simply mixed or added to traditional or local elements, thus possibly colliding modern ideas. Institutional syncretism combines the old and the new traditional and modern, informal and formal elements, which are interwoven in a creative process, thus forming a completely new type of institution. The institutional syncretism is the right answer to the reconcept reconceptualization of wastewater treatment. Um, yes, basically to continue old institutions under new conditions while acknowledging, 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 excuse me, please, <clears throat> endogenous, which are embedded social norms and exogenous access barriers, which we described as costs and poverty, etc. Once the foundation has been laid by diminishing the barriers and a proper institutional environment has been created, one can accelerate sludge management towards sustainability by introducing regulatory mechanisms. These should bridge the gap of com compliance with existing legislation, provide capacity and resources to ensure implementation at the local or municipal level, enforce and follow up on existing legislation and strengthen the political will to do so, update legislation and harmonize legislation relevant to sludge management, change perception about waste, and put society's interest above political interest by setting up the rules of the game accordingly. Furthermore, regulation should be generic enough so it can be applied in different contexts alike, 
yet be still specific enough to do the job and set up the right standards and have clear rules for penalties and sanctions. Regulation needs to be adapted to the local context and issued to avoid imposition of generic and not numerically quantified limits, which may have general applicability and are different, but are difficult to be widely applied and prosecuted and unjustified, although numerically quantified limits, which could become dangerous in certain situations. The second step towards acceleration is to provide standardization. The development of standardized characterization methods is a necessary support to the development of regulation, since well-defined procedures allow legal requirements to be fulfilled in a correct and uniform manner, thus building stakeholder and public confidence. Digitalization as a third pillar can support these objectives by providing features such as an app to, communi to communicate barrier-free with, with, uh, between citizens and the utilities, thus again building stakeholder confidence. But digitalization can be applied in three different fields. The first one is controlling energy consumption, second one is reducing toxicity, and the third one is to optimize sludge transportation. It's very important to see that this digital concept is defined by system optimization above process optimization. Real-time data obtained by digital twins provide a firm information base on the quantity and characterization of sewage sludge. Wastewater treatment plants tend to be highly energy consumptive and are ranked as one of the most important energy consum consumers managed by municipalities. Real-time data, again here, um, can obtain, uh, can provide a firm information base on the quantity of sewage sludge. Depending on the quantity that is produced on a daily or short-term short basis, energy and chemical input for, for treatment can be regulated. Short-term fluctuations, for example, seasonal, seasonal ones in sludge production can thus be leveled out. One of the foremost challenges in wastewater management is the diverse nature of contaminants of wastewater, since different industries contribute different constituents to the wastewater. With wastewater discharge from industries, especially from chemical manufacturing, it is important to ensure that the presence of toxic chemicals is below the specified concentration. Quality control becomes very important. Sensor technology is useful in both wastewater and sludge management, and sensors can be used to analyze recovery worthy as well as toxic compounds. Quality control by integrating sensor technology with artificial intelligence allows for cost effective safety measurement with quick results, thus reducing transaction costs via time consuming procedures through labs. Sludge management cannot be seen in a silo and involves the transportation towards its destination, either as waste towards a waste depot or landfill, or second, as a product or commodity for agricultural use or cement plants. Decision makers are enabled to get insights via the digital twin uh, by knowing sludge, for example, by knowing the sludge destination and a con conscious choice can be made in choosing the right treatment method and the right transportation mode. Um, please bear in mind, again, the concept of the locomotive, which basically starts at the end, at the sludge. And um, this is basically what we try to say here, that once we know where, uh, what the final destination or what the destination of, of sludge should be, one can uh, accordingly treat sludge, so um, what kind of techno technology to use and um, to maximize the recovery value and, for example, um, further minimize toxicity, etc. So yes, so basically the three pillars I've introduced in my part are regulation, standardization and digitalization. And um, they support, they basically accelerate sludge management towards sustainability. Yet, uh, in order for them to work, it's very important that we create the right institutional environment by using the right path, which we have 
defined as institutional syncretism. And it's tremendously important to, uh, to diminish or at least reduce the barriers which um, stop um, to create the right environment for the three pillars to stand on. So yeah, I think I've more or less basically said this. So the, the most important um, part is basically to have, to create the right institutional environment, which is not just a legal job, um, it's a political decision-making, it's the people who work for it. And um, it's very, very important to uh, diminish the barriers, which are like, which can be endogenous. Um, by um, providing local solutions and very contextualized solutions, basically tailor-made solutions, and uh, respect the local variety. Um, way more important, it is also to diminish ex exogenous barriers, which are mostly cost-related, so that everybody has access to a proper wastewater system. And um, one solution that we introduce in our concept is pricing mechanisms that basically target at different aspects um, like find um, supporting to fine-tune social aspects but also to ensure long-term investment into the field of wastewater management um, yes second and third very important factors are the regulatory um, methods and standardization methods and also appropriate business models that make sludge an attractive commodity, um, including supply chain mechanisms towards the destination, and also to incentivize the industry to produce fewer toxic compounds at, at the very, very basic level, but also to introduce digitalization methods such as sensor technology to um, further um, allow us to get rid of the contaminants, which are very complex in waste, um, in wastewater and sludge. And um, digitalization also allows us to obtain a greater operational capacity um, to, through real-time monitoring and building also stakeholder confidence by reducing barriers between citizen and institutions, for example, through web, uh, through web applications. Yes, thank you very much. And um, yes, Richard. And uh, yeah, that's a very interesting aspect of uh, from the institution aspect as well. The uh, you know, uh, oftentimes uh, that that part of the consideration hasn't been looked at as much. But uh, yeah, glad you you brought those up. So uh, the remaining time we uh, have time for. Uh, questions and uh, discussion uh, with some of the, the points that have been presented. So perhaps we'll start with the question that uh, have come in. Uh, I know that these uh, couple of slides related to uh, the conclusions are already been covered, but uh, uh, so I think we'll, we'll go to the Q&A at this point. Ludovico, so yeah, if you both of you probably should turn your mic on and uh, yes, in, and the video as well as we address Q and A, please. So I think oh, the, I don't. Uh, sorry, but I, no, it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. The microphone is okay. The camera, no. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, no, it's okay. You. Okay, fine, fine. Okay, fine. Yeah. It's a little little slower. That's it. So anyway. The, there is uh, the first question is addressed to you, Nodovico. Uh, uh, yes, I, but as you, you said, yeah. you like uh, reply to this question, you can do that, no problem. Right. <laughs> the uh, question I, is, do you, okay, do you I have just, just two, yeah. two words, two words. Uh, the problem is not only question of uh, cost, it's, uh, the cost is uh, mainly related to, to the size of the plants. The aerobic uh, uh, digestion or stabilization is more adapted for small plant. The anaerobic for bigger plant, which give also the possibility to recover energy. But now there are many, many, um, many uh, new plants that couple a, 
uh, anaerobic followed by uh, anaerobic mesophilic. And this could be an optimization of the process. So, okay, yeah. So the question is uh, talking about CAPEX and OPEX comparison for aerobic and anaerobic stabilization. Uh, you know, so so certainly, yeah, I to totally agree, Ludovic. Uh, I think the size of the facility uh, has a lot to do with that decision. Uh, so, uh, you know, but there are exceptions as well related to that, and we can uh, discuss it further later on if, if needed. Our second question, uh, what can be done to, uh, in, in case a wastewater treatment plant is already operating and, and yet sludge management <laughs> was not properly accounted for? There, there are plenty of examples of that, unfortunately. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and a follow-up on that is in, in the case of an urban area where there is no land for possible uh, adding uh, the uh, for possible expansion to include sludge treatment processes. So uh, it, the question is not addressed to anybody specifically, but uh, Ludo, you wanna you wanna start addressing that maybe? Uh, I just want to add something. Uh, in the case, I don't know. It depends. Uh, uh, what is the size of the plant uh, everything and what is already available but in any case i think in the case when uh, sludge is not there is not enough land for utilization in agriculture and the the, 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 the plant works to produce some some sludge for agricultural purpose probably the best way is to find some solution that allows uh, the pro the, to produce for example composting you can produce from the sludge some compost that can be commercialized elsewhere in other places. So you have the, is, is the sludge is difficult to be transported and so on, but compost is, could be in some bags and you can transfer everything. This is just one example of the possibility, but obviously uh, it, it should be necessary to have more, more other. Uh, in the case, in the following, the, questions can just the same where there is no land for possible expansion uh, this is a big problem i don't know we can i cannot respond uh, i i hope that can be um, yeah, I, I i hope that it will be possible in the vicinity in the surrounding of the plant is possible to have enough space for building a, a, a composting plant to went to, to which sludge can be uh, can be sent, for example, together with other organic waste, solid waste or agricultural organic waste, just to produce a compost of good quality, for example, this could be. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll add to that. So cer certainly, if if there's no space, uh, you're out of luck. Uh, you can't add any treatment processes on site. So off-site consideration. Uh, I think compost, as Ludo indicated, could be an option, uh, but I think, uh, you know, potentially other, look, look at other treatment plans uh, that the system may have. Uh, I, I guess your location, specific location, it would determine what it is. Sounds like it's an urban area, there's an urban area. Maybe you already have a collection system there, uh, so you can look into uh, how to transport or convey the sludge to other places off-site, either uh, for a dedicated sludge management site for treatment or another treatment plan uh, that the utility may own uh, that has space for uh, treatment as well. You know, so we centralizing solid treatment is not uncommon. So uh, that can be done if, it, if it's available. So I, I think you're you're down to those those options under the under this particular scenario, but uh, certainly isn't uncommon. Uh, we we have seen a lot of plans that that have not planned on uh, sludge management. Uh, that answer your question. If I can add something, uh, yeah. the question of uh, realizing a centralized plant. 
could be a possibility, but in the case that the plant must be very close to each other and uh, small in practice. But there is the contrary. For example, in the case of, uh, of um, for the watering, there are, there are some experiences in which a machine for the watering is mounted on a truck and it, uh, this machine could be uh, too big for a single plant because they are very small plants. So he go every day to another plant to dewater the sludge of the other plant. It's the contrary of the centralized plant. But uh, this could, uh, there are many situations in, in uh, uh, which the, this, this, works, this works. Okay. Well, let's move to the next question. So this one's on Pujara. Uh, and the question is, uh, is there any example that can be cited concerning the needed institutional syn syncretism that you mentioned? Uh, maybe some experience already in place? Can you address this, Punja? Um, yes, sure. So, for, for example, there is um, one would be, uh, it's called the Kreislauf Wirtschaftsgesetz, which is established, which has been established in Germany like 10 years ago. So which basically incorporate the idea of circular economy. Um, so that, that would be one example. Um, another example would be um, the yeah, law for um, water more or less in, in South Africa. Um, they basically try to use the idea of um, water as being integrated, as being an integrated um, system. So they don't look at water anymore through, admin, through an administrative lens, but see all water uh, resources as, as natural basins, like as a, like where you could say they included um, a holistic approach. And um, they, and there is a lot of uh, approaches like that coming up. Um, India also around 10 years ago, try um, established a new uh, national water policy where um, one has incorporated um, a lot of um, aspects um, concerning um, cultural factors and socioeconomical factors, but also like local technology, local knowledge, um, basically to provide um, a bottom-up approach in, when it comes to water management. So um, there is definitely a switch in thinking happening, um, yet um, I suppose there is way more work to be done um, especially concern, considering aspects when it comes to um, yeah, addressing the gaps between what is what is the law, um, what is the legal status, and what is what is the actual behavior of people, and also providing them with with the right um, incentives and the right motives, but also the right resources, so they can bridge that gap. Thank you. Uh, so there's another question from Ifred Hadass uh, asking about case studies or success stories. Um, can you be a little bit more specific on, on sending in at the, the question on what we're talking about, case study uh, or success stories? Is it related to a certain aspect of sludge management? Uh, so I, you know, Luke, uh, maybe we'll, we'll wait for a clarification for the, the question here. Let me move down to, uh, another question for Puja, actually. Uh, <coughs> do you think EU in recent future will introduce the use of waste sludge or sewage to feed insects, which are then used as fish stock for fish? or for cattle, uh, thus to reduce the impact of cattle, but also to implement a new way of considering the sludge. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, that, well, that's, that's, that's a very interesting uh, approach. It, I, I, it haven't, I have no information about this approach, so I'm, I'm sorry I cannot answer, an, answer that question, but I think it's, it's very interesting. Well, so, 
I have not heard that we try to use waste sludge directly to feed insects. Um, I guess the, the closest thing I, I have seen is uh, vermicomposting. I guess they, they have these worms that help compost and stabilize uh, the sludge. Uh, but I, I'm not sure that they use the worm to feed livestock either. So, but, but certainly interesting thought. And I think uh, if uh, the sludge can be treated or stabilized adequately, uh, you know, so, so the impact of potential contaminants in there uh, can be addressed. I think that's certainly a potential uh, way uh, additional way of, of, of uh, using the, the material, reusing the material in the future. Luda, what do you think? Do you have any thought on this? Nah, I am a mechanical engineer, so for me, it's quite, <laughs> it's quite difficult to speak about the toxic pollutants, excuse me, uh, for, 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 excuse me, for feeding uh, worms and so on. Yeah. I don't know. But I, my, my, my personal opinion is that there are so many possibilities to reuse sludge. I think that we could leave this opposite, just as uh, the left, if nothing, nothing else is possible to do. Uh, this is like the recirculation, for example, of uh, water, the water from wastewater plant after treatment can be also used for uh, drinking water, to obtain drinking water. But in my opinion, it's better to leave for drinking water best uh, some better sources and to leave the water from plants for many other uses, agricultural, industrial, and so on. This is my general concept. But if you like, Richard, uh, I wish just to make uh, uh, to the colleague that uh, asked about studies or success stories. Now, I forgot Shabbat. I just would like to, rem to remember uh, an unsuccess story <laughs> that showed uh, clearly what was done. Some years ago, uh, possibly 10 years ago, I visited a plant in which uh, they, uh, the plant, the, the reuse of, of sludge was used in agriculture. And they, uh, for, the, for the watering, they used some uh, belt presses and uh, that produced the sludge the, the final concentration, the solid concentration of the sludge after belt pressing was of 20%, about 20%. But to send, to distribute on land, to spread on land this sludge, they had to add water to reach the 15%. So they first dewatered and then, then rewatered again. I said, okay, it is so easy. You uh, one part go to 20%, another part leave as it is, 10% after thickening or 6%, and then put together. And you spend a lot of money less. This is a typical story of unsuccess. Okay. So actually, the uh, yeah, the, uh, I got a clarification of the case study that they're asking for is in regard to decarbonization of sludge processing. Do you have anything to add, Ludo? Well, uh, this, uh, uh, the, there are in, in, in this last, uh, there are in the develop, in development, uh, many other plants working on the car decarbonization, the gasification and so on. But uh, as far as I know, these are not uh, in um, uh, not convenient from a, a full size plan. These are only the, a little bit more the experimental. So there will be some other times, more times to really uh, obtain the good uh, result. What uh, is important to say, for example, one of the technologies this is developed in the last period. Let me check is the development of uh, fuel cell, sludge fuel cell, directly to produce electricity from sludge during fuel cell. Using this is a very promising 
but still not on uh, full scale available. Yeah. So, you know, when, when, when you refer to decarbonization, I, I assume you're talking about uh, reducing the carbon footprint of the processing. Uh, and so I, I think that there are uh, quite a few uh, good examples out there uh, that are successful uh, in terms of doing that. Uh, you know, a lot of, a number of plants have extract, have uh, been able to extract energy uh, from solids processing, right? Anaerobic digestion is certainly uh, one way to do that. And, uh, you know, by extracting biogas, reusing the biogas, uh, and in a way to uh, sustain the processes. Uh, there, I have also seen some thermal processes uh, that were very close to circular uh, in terms of processing. Uh, you know, they, again, uh, dewater the solids uh, and uh, combust, well, first dry the solids and then pyrolysis uh, process to uh, decompose the sludge uh, and then extract the thermal energy through the pyrolysis process and utilizing that energy uh, to sustain the thermal drying process up front. So, so the energy uh, balance is fairly, uh, fa fairly close in terms of, the, of being circular. So certainly that reduces uh, the overall carbon footprint if you're comparing to uh, just strictly dewatering the material, having to then transport it out to some other site uh, and, and, you know, for other disposal and options, all that. So the number of this can be uh, cited for that. So let me move to another question. I think we have a few others. Do you have success experience uh, to share about digitization in FICO sludge collection system? Who would like is, again, is not addressed uh, specifically to a presenter, uh, Ludo or Puja, do you have something to share? Uh, well, I know that uh, certain companies do use digital methods uh, when it comes, for example, to chemical input mm -hmm. and um, also to, yeah, basically what I mentioned to, to sort of um, regulate the chemical input towards um, the necessity, towards the actual necessity, which is uh, relevant to the quantity. Okay, so, so the, the question is specifically about application for fecal sludge collection system. All right, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. No, so I, I do not have any any example on my hand. Yeah, I, I, I cannot, I'm not familiar with that either. Ludo, do you have anything to share? So sorry, we, we don't have any, but uh, we any example that we can share in that regard. Could composting and shoe slush disinfection used in agriculture, for example, how can we enhance the composting process uh, to reach slush disinfection? I can try to address that, but Ludo, are you still with us? Maybe maybe he's having audio difficulty. So let me let me address that. So the question, the answer is yes, composting uh, can effectively disinfect the sludge, but uh, the operation uh, need to be uh, controlled adequately. Uh, so the way to disinfect it, it's, it's through the heat generated in composting. So you can maintain, uh, first of all, uh, have operating conditions uh, and that can reach uh, sufficient temperature uh, people who have done composting know, uh, depending on how how hot you can maintain that pile, you know, obviously it's a function of uh, how you prepare the mix, what kind of feedstock you have, and so on and so forth. But if you can uh, adequately address that and, and ensure the temperature uh, uh, is adequately, the required disinfection uh, temperature is rich. 
uh, during your process, then I think you can be successful uh, in doing so. But I, in any yeah. case, I think that the, the, the use of a word disinfection is not correct for, for, a, for a compost. I think that sanitification should be better. Uh, because a real disinfection uh, are required. Okay, it should be any case, just. Uh... Well, yeah, good point. Uh, so you, in composting, well, so disinfection, I, I guess you, somebody has to define what, what that really means. So, but we're, we're not pasteurizing the, the sludge, right, in composting. You're not killing everything that's in it, uh, but it, it can, uh, for example, in the U.S., you can have a compost th that is adequately meeting a class A pathogen reduction requirement, for example. You know, that I think you can uh, find a, a similar European standard for that. So, so that is reducing substantially uh, the pathogen level uh, in the uh, finished compost. So that uh it, you know to, to me is adequately disinfecting it uh to the acceptable level uh for use so hopefully that answers your question adequately i do also do think uh, you spoke about uh, states that's uh, that's true but you have consider also the developing countries where yeah. the, these conditions are difficult to be obtained yeah yeah Okay, so well, related to that, our next question actually is uh, so a fairly general question. Any advice for small island developing states with our land space? Uh, what options may be available to them? Ludo, you want to pick that, or Puja, you can uh, try. Uh, I think that the problem is that uh, how small is the islands, and which kind of space you need. So I think that in this case, for example, in the some islands of the Maldives, no, uh, you have that uh, the small islands have in a small there where there is an hotel, no, uh, um, uh, an hotel or a uh, um, uh, CS an hotel. Uh, they use the uh, incinerator in practice, an incinerator plant, and they recover the energy to uh, to feed. The, the all the system of the aisle, for example, this could be an idea. Uh, but this is in case for very small plants. Uh, in case you have a, a big space, you can have a, a better plant, not not the incinerator, not thermal processes, but you can have a normal process, but you have not space for uh, using sludge. I, yeah, you can make uh, the question of composting that we said before. You can said you can pr produce compo compost and commercialize it in the surrounding countries. Could could be any an, an hypothesis, but it, it's necessary to see case by case. Yeah, it's certainly agree with that. It, it's you know very very challenging when you don't have space and you're also in a in a place that. Uh, high technology, high tech uh, approach may may not be appropriate. <laughs> so, because yeah, yeah. usually the low low tech treatment requires space, and if you don't have the space, uh, you need to look be looking at high rate type of system, and and that typically require a more advanced type of treatment, uh, or you know you need to be looking for a solution that does not generate a lot of, of end product or residue, right? So if you don't have land to use it and you're in a, on an island, which means transporting it uh, offsite would be difficult. I, I see another question for me. If there is any new technology that can dry sludge to 35% moisture from 65% moisture coming from centrifugal, the watering process. I think that in this case, uh, only some something uh, drying uh, by thermal, uh, by heat should be possible. Because uh, you can use filter press, but uh, feeding a filter press with uh, a sludge having already 65% of moisture, it means 35 uh, 
solids uh, is difficult to feed and to work. So probably in this case, only some dryer could be enough, could be necessary to improve the solids concentration. This is my opinion. I, I don't know if it's personal, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add a little bit to that. So yeah, 35% moisture is, is fairly low for sludge cake. So without thermal drying, uh, can you reach it? I think there are a number of factors. First of all, what's in your sludge? What kind of sludge are we talking about? Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the only thing that I can, uh, that I have seen through my career that came close to that, and I'm not saying, you know, exactly at 65, but if anything that can reach beyond 50% uh, solid dry content, uh, will require some kind of pretreatment uh, to your sludge, uh, especially uh, when when biological sludge is is part of it. Uh, and uh, you know, so the processes like uh, wet wet oxidation, thermal hydrolysis, those type of pretreatment uh, tend to improve the the waterability of the of the sludge quite a bit, and changes the viscosity as well. So that they tend to improve uh, dewatering, whether or not it will hit 65% uh, percent dryness, uh, it's, it's questionable. I think it's a function of how, uh, how what the makeup of, of your sludge is. You know, if it's a, a dredge, you know, material, you probably will get that. But, but if it's a, a typical municipal uh, sewage sludge, uh, I, I think it will be uh, quite challenging to, to try to achieve that. I ju just a comment. Uh, yeah. Why uh, I don't like to, to, to put two processes in line as in sequence to obtain this one. It's better to eliminate the first one and produce di di directly from the beginning to 35 solids through a dryer. Why using two processes? It's a complication, I, I think. Yeah. Okay, uh, we got another question here. Technology is only part of the solution. How these systems are operated and maintain a fair access to FSM? I'm not sure what that is. I would be interested in hearing about regulations and standardization from Puja that have worked to ensure the poorest are able to access safely managed sanitation surfaces such as um, emptying and that also ensure proper operation of treatment facility. So Pooja, this is yours. Um, yes, so, well, I am sort of uh, a little bit um well i can't i cannot really give you good examples for it um i have i have more negative examples than positive examples um like one example i i tried to state in my presentation was that of the world bank where um one has one has tried to incentivize um people uh, with, with with the pricing mechanism now, when it comes to um, regulations and standardization, I do not really have a body of work that gives me that sort of information. Um, I feel that a lot has been done in the last 10 years, I think, um, there's uh, last 10 to 15 years, but perhaps um, we need to wait for the results to, to actually to be seen. So, um, I must really, yes, I must say, I'm sorry, I don't have examples at my hand, but I think that's going to be homework for me. Uh, I can add something uh, in this field, because uh, as I am a part of the, of the standardization activities at SEN, European Committee for Standardization and ISO, uh, just to remain in mind that there are in both programs, uh, in both institutions, two specific 
projects uh, or technical committee devoted to sludge standardization. And in particular, it is the ISO TC275 and ISO and the SEN TC308. And within this uh, technical committee, uh, all the uh, all the standards relevant technological, uh, chemical, uh, biological, and so on are standardized just to guarantee that in uniformity and comparison, a reliable comparison between uh, results obtained in a different results. So you you can check if in the in the uh, in, the, in the project that I mentioned. You can check there are a lot of studies of reports of standard and so on also well, in the field of, of uh, safety well perhaps uh, what i can say is that i mean there are a lot of small uh, projects um like uh, where where one introduces um sort of uh, proper sanitation systems which also um have have sort of on-site um, management of faecal sludge and, and composting methods and all of that. Um, but it's like, those are like sort of bottom approaches and, and rather very small scale and very localized. And um, like, for example, the, the water policy in India, they sort of promote these sort of projects. But I think that it has nothing really to do with, with um, a wide regulatory process. Um, in, in this case. So um, this is basically, those are like sort of um, small scale solutions, bottom up solutions um, that are sort of promoted um, by the nation states, by de in developing countries. Um, but it's, it's not like um, a nationwide regulation as such. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is addressed to both presenters. I'll start with you, Punja. Uh, the question is about uh, any experience, a situation where the sludge from a water treatment plant is classified as schedule waste due to the usage of alumus coagulin, then what option do, you, do we have to reuse the sludge? Okay, I can say that uh, this depends from the national legislation, the regulation. Each regulation has some limits for uh, metals or some other materials in the sludge for the reuse. So it's difficult to, to, to say. Uh, in Europe, for example, there are some, there is a general limits fixed by the European Union, and then each state can fix stringer, more stringent uh, limits for use in their own country. But and yes, there are also, there are, cannot, cannot say anything else, this one. It depends from the local uh, regulations. Puja, do you have anything to add on this? On this one particularly, no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think those are the question I have. There's a comment added to about solid content. Double drying can reach up to 80%. Yes, uh, definitely can do. Actually, thermal drying can dry to any uh, dryness that you desire if you uh, allow enough time. Uh, for it uh, to, to do that. But if you're referring to the discussion we have earlier on regarding the 65% dryness, I think that question was specifically related to a dewatering process, not a thermal drying process. So we were referring to a, a mechanical dewatering process. Okay. I think that's the end of the list oh actually there there were a couple that actually came in uh, on the chat let me see if i miss anything here i was hoping to one comment here I was hoping to hear of options for sludge management for sits which do not have space 
S I D S. What's that referring to? Puja and. Uh, Where do you read this question? It's it's from the chat. They should have put it in Q and A. Ah, before. from the chat. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, but I I'm not sure what it is. Could you perhaps repeat the question? I was hoping to hear of option for sludge management for sets as IDS, which do not have space. Oh, okay. So like like in, in terms like of of the sludge destination, like landfill. Or uh, what is sure or is. regarding space in which context? Yeah, I'm not sure I can interpret it adequately. But, but that's... I, I, I don't see what is the question. Uh... Well, if it's ah, about... okay, yes. I was hoping to hear option for Zlajma in for SEDS, this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is small islands. Eh? This is the abbreviation of uh, small islands. I, well, I, I mean, one, one, one could uh, transport sludge like through, through pipelines or through um, other modes, I mean, through shipping. Um, but that is, that is sort of, that would make sense um, if you would have basically a proper economic structure uh, and, and then you could really say, okay, uh, these people, they, they need sort of that sludge. I mean, if you have the example of Maladives, you could say that Maladives could export its sludge to, to a neighboring country, um, if it makes sense. Um, and, and that could be possible if, if you would treat sludge as a commodity and if you could provide the right quantity um, then it is possible also to, to bring in different modes of transportation such as pipelines or ships or um, trucks is perhaps difficult when it's an island but um, yes and, and their regulation can also help um, I mean if, if you if you regulate it in a, in a manner that um, you you're basically allowed to transport sludge over a long distance, um, very often that is not not the case or that's not possible. Um, so it really depends also on that. But but I feel for small islands which don't have space for landfilling, um, I think first first and foremost it would be great perhaps to produce as less sludge as possible and and perhaps yeah. perhaps small islands shouldn't have uh, big industrial complexes or that much of dense population so anyway not much not much of sludge is produced and that bit of sludge that is produced it could be composted uh, immediately and um, there shouldn't be any toxic elements involved so per perhaps there is not even a necessity to to you know to yes. um for landfilling so you are the, right. these would you be are... the two options um yes transportation over a longer distance and um, basically not creating any any sludge that needs landfilling but just composting and be or as organic as possible Yes, I agree with you, as I told before, the same. But uh, just it's better to, to remind that in case of transporting sludge, this is the case in which the volume of the sludge must be reduced as much as possible. <laughs> because uh, especially if you go to shipping or to, to use some pipelines or so, it depends, okay. Great, well, we, we have two minutes left, so I want to thank our presenters. And also to just take a minute to uh, conclude uh, a very interesting aspect, uh, you know, on, on sludge management. Uh, it's still very challenging. You know, we've tried to address the technical aspect and institution aspect. Uh, and certainly agree, you know, sludge management need to be the driving force uh, in a lot of these planning effort, not just the end as an afterthought. Uh, I find it very interesting that Ludovico uh, kind of characterized the, the new two, two aspects of technical as uh, the nu nuisance reduction and volume reduction, but a very practical certainly is true that we've been working on those very closely. But I think uh, another aspect, uh, you know, related to the quality 
uh, of the resulting residual is also very important uh, to be able to use the material adequately. Uh, sort of that sort of address a little bit uh, under the institution aspect as to, uh, as Puja uh, discussed the uh, uh, the quality of the lack of toxicity of toxic compounds in the product. So that's very important. Certainly. The, from the institution aspect, regulation uh, uh, has as a, a big uh, influence on what can be done. Uh, understand that uh, the EU is considering revising some of that, those uh, directives uh, in the next year or so. So we would be very interested in uh, looking at uh, what uh, comes that way. So with that, again, thank you. Uh, Dr. Spinoza and Pooja uh, to uh, present at the seminar and appreciate all everybody who participated. So with that, uh, let's move yes. towards the, the end. Uh, you know, there are a couple of uh, upcoming webinars if you're interested uh, and the details here. And also uh, IWA is actively recruiting new members. So uh, he, you can use the code to, uh, to get 20% off. So with that, thank you again and goodbye. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.